So there are three, I'll call them sort of concepts in mass spec. And none of them in their own right are per profound. The concepts are exact mass, isotopic abundances, and fragmentation. We hinted a little bit at fragmentation in our, in our last lecture, but honestly, we're going to see it in a very different way in EI mass spec, but we're going to save this for next time. So isotopic masses or exact mass and isotopic abundances aren't profound. You don't even need, you know, anything more than freshman chemistry. The whole problem is that since we have been freshmen, we have been used to the idea of thinking about the atomic weights. We've been thinking about carbon as 12.011. If you want to go ahead and weigh out a mole of, of a compound with four carbon atoms and whatever and whatever, you'd say, okay, that mole is going to weigh four times 12.011 plus whatever we use for hydrogen, 1.007, I think 99, I'll write it on the board in a moment, um, 994. Um, but we have to shift that mindset here, and that's going to become important. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how that affects high, what used to be called high resolution mass spectrometry, but these days is called high accuracy mass spec. And then if we have a chance at the end, because I didn't have a chance to talk about this last time, we'll talk about the so-called nitrogen rule, which is just a, another simple feature of mathematics. Um, so I think I'm going to begin by talking about high accuracy mass spec because it provides a nice, a nice sort of entry into the, the concepts of really thinking isotopologue by isotopologue. So let me just say then for high, what we'll call high accuracy mass spec, formally I'd say, as I'd say, high resolution mass spec, you may have heard about that, it by that name. So what I want to say is with better instrumentation and calibration, we can get mass to charge ratio with a very high precision. put a little arrow to indu indicate leads to M to Z ratios with high precision. And by high precision, I mean something like, um, for example, let's say plus or minus five parts in a million, parts per million, or even, even plus or minus three parts per million or better. And there are instruments, ICR instruments, ion cyclotron resonance instruments that can go in order of magnitude better than this. So just to put this into context, since we haven't uh, been thinking about this before, let's just say, for example, if we had 300.000, I don't think there's any molecule that's exactly 300.0000, but it's a nice number for sort of a, a small organic molecule. We're talking about for five parts per million, 
we're talking about plus or minus 0 0.01015, and we would refer to that as 1.5 millimass units or MMU. And so that's going to give you an idea of how, how precise you should get this. So I'm not going to talk about calculating these other than to say there that computers are very good at calculating all permutations of formula that fit within a certain range. So later on, I will give you your Silverstein is nuts. They go ahead, they still publish a 20 page table as an appendix of formulas that match certain molecular weights. I will give you an online tool that you will have access to that can give you formulas that match exact masses and you'll be able to get formulas. And then you just wanna know, okay, what am I looking for? What range would I plug in as a, as a match? And I'd say within five, you know, five parts per million is a, is a pretty, pretty good one. Um, and then what I'll say here is the, uh, the molecular weight or M to Z is dictated by the atomic weights of the isotopes present. And this is where, this is where we have to shift our mindset. We have to start thinking about the masses of the individual isotopes because you are literally flying molecule by molecule in the mass spectrometer to the detector, meaning that although carbon is 12.011, your molecules are either going to have all carbon 12s, which are 12.0000, or some of them, statistical percentage, will have one C13, or if you have a very big molecule, maybe you'll have a statistical chance, a reasonable chance of having two C13s. So I wanna start by going ahead and writing down some numbers here and I think the reason, I'm sure all of these are in, in a table in Silverstein, but the reason I want to write them explicitly is to get us used to this shift in mindset away from what we've been thinking of since freshman chemistry or even high school chemistry, the 12.011 and the like. All right, so I'm gonna give us a table and we're gonna, Let's say we're going to go ahead and start to think of these explicitly as we start to think about exact mass. So as I said, for carbon, we're used to the concept of the atomic weight, right? You can go to any periodic table and you'll find to some number of decimal points, carbon is 12.0111. Five, and I think a fun fact is the mole has gotten slightly redefined and hence the <laughs> quintillion digit here as we've redefined the kilogram away from a, a physical weight into, uh, into actual units. But that honestly doesn't affect chemists. But what does affect us is the fact that carbon-12 is different from your atomic one. The carbon-12 constitutes 98.9% of all carbon on you know, terrestrial molecules. And the mass of carbon-12 is set at 12.0000. And as I said, maybe out in the zillion decimal point now with the change in the kilogram, maybe there's been a a teeny change, but that's not going to affect us. But you have 1.1% of C13 and the mass of that, and we're not in general going to worry about 
the isotopologues and their masses will only concentrate on the primary isotope. Um, the mass of that is 13.00333. And then just to keep sort of, to give us a few additional atoms, I want to give us sort of the basis of most of organic chemistry here. And so let's next do hydrogen. Hydrogen, your atomic weight in your periodic table is 1.00794. So if you're calculating a mole of benzene, you take six times 12.011 plus you know, 01115 plus six times 1.00794. But if you're going ahead and actually thinking about the mass spectrum, you've got to recognize that even in the case of hydrogen, there's a small amount, about one part in 7,000 of deuterium naturally occurring. And so we need to think about our H1 isotope that constitutes 99.984 percent and then we have a small amount of deuterium constituting 0.16 percent and the atomic mass of of our protium of our H1 is 1.00783 And I'll show you how we're going to use this in a second. But for many organic compounds, we'll also have nitrogen and oxygen. So I'll write those numbers down. As I said, this is all in the table in your book. But I wanted at least once to pass in front of your eyes, through your brain, and to the paper or, or iPad or whatever tablet you're using in front of you so that you really internalize this. All right, so let's talk about nitrogen. Nitrogen, the atomic weight, the number that we've been familiar with since we've been freshmen, is 14.0067. And nitrogen is only predominantly the N14 isotope, that's 99.62%. And there's a tiny bit, 0.38% of N15 in our nitrogen. So the atomic weight, the mass, shall we say, that we're going to use for nitrogen is going to be slightly different. It's 14.00307. And ditto for oxygen. Oxygen's atomic weight is 15.99 is four. But oxygen also is a mixture of isotopes. It's predominantly O16. It's 99.76% O16. And there's a teeny tiny bit, 0.04% of O17, and a slightly larger bit of O18, 0.20%. And so again, we're going to focus on the mass of oxygen and the mass of the atomic of the isotopologue of the O16 isotope, rather, is Thoughts or comments at this point?
So one, one fun fact is that when you go slightly lower than unity for an element, they call it a mass defect. And, of course, there's nothing defective about oxygen. You know, if anything, oxygen, you could say, is better than carbon because its nucleus is being, O16 is being held together more tightly, hence the lower mass relative to unity, than C12. I mean, this is basically theory of relativity equals mc squared. What, you know? Oxygen, carbon-12, contains six protons and six neutrons. Oxygen-16 contains eight and eight, and yet it's not 12.000 and 16.000. It's slightly less because the energy holding the nucleus together is slightly more, and so you will end up with uh, equals mc squared, slightly less. Anyway, they call it a mass defect. And some elements like fluorine have a mass defect that's noticeable. So sometimes you'll see that a peak will be slightly less than unity, and that can be a teeny tiny clue of what elements are present in the peak. Anyway, all right, let's go ahead and take this knowledge and put it to some good use. So we have the basics of organic chemistry. I'll give you a little bit more for organic chemistry in just a moment, but this is a good, good point to make a comparison and do, do some simple math. So let's go ahead and compare two simple molecules. So we'll, we'll compare propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, and acetaldehyde, CH3, CHO. And so both of these molecules nominally have a molecular weight of 44. But one of the cool things about high accuracy mass spec is that with extra precision, you can actually tell these two molecules apart. And the math is simple enough that I think I'll just do it right here because I think it's useful, again, to work through the calculation. So we have to put ourselves into the mindset of looking at the individual isotopologues, the predominant isotopologue, the isotopologue that has carbon-12 and H1. And so if we think about the exact mass of this molecule, now we're going to have three times 12 point as many zeros as you want. I'm just going to put five zeros plus eight times 1.00783. And we come up with 44.0626 as our exact mass. If we consider the predominant isotopologue of acetaldehyde, now we're going to be considering uh, C12, two C12s, four H1s, and one O16. And again, if we do the exact mass, we're going to be getting now two times 12.0000, as many zeros as I care to write, plus four times 1.00783, plus one times 15.9941. I'll throw in a one there. And that's going to equal 44.0262. And so 
the point of all of this is that the difference here, shall we say delta, is 36.4 millimass units, right, 0 0.00364, which is going to be a substantial difference and either with that table in Silverstein, which I said these days is pretty useless, or a computer, which is what you'll use in your, your homework, can give you all formulas that fit the exact mass. You know, if there's one thing that's the most useful piece of information you could have in thinking about what a molecule is, the first thing I would say is, give me the molecular formula. Well, you can have the molecular formula. So thoughts, thoughts, questions at this point. So mass defect is just a um, isotope log that has a mass slightly lower than the atomic mass? Yeah, and I, a mass defect would be a term for an isotope or an isotopolog that has a mass slightly less than unity. And it's just a teeny tiny clue in an exact mass that you might have a particular element present. It's not, not especially, especially valuable. Um, but it can clue you in that something is up. So for example, chlorine, the chlorine 35 isotope has a mass of 34.9689. So it's a prominent mass defect. Anyway, it is, it is sort of an interesting and fun fact for oxygen. And on, on some occasions it can be useful. You know, it's interesting. The, um, I hadn't even been mentioning this in the class. And a few years back, one student in the class was talking about a structure and mentioned the mass defect as being useful for him in it. And at that point, I thought, okay, I should at least mention it. If he's found it useful, maybe others will in terms of cluing, cluing them in. Other thoughts or comments? All right, so let's go on. Let's go on and look at isotopic abundances and start to see see the practical implications of this. And I'll start with a couple of very very simple examples and just a few pigeon scrawls of sketches on the whiteboard here. So So we are separating molecule by molecule, or more specifically, ion by ion in the mass spectrometer. And so for methane, and I'm just going to give you, I know I said that all, we will not be doing a lot of EI mass spec, but I'm going to give you a sketch of the EI mass spec. Now remember, EI mass spec 
is the technique where you generate a molecular ion, not by adding a proton or a sodium, but by kicking out an electron. So in kicking out, electrons weigh virtually nothing. And so if we go ahead and we plot our mass to charge for C14, and I'm just going to do it to, uh, for, for, for methane, for CH4, I'm just going to do it for unity here. We would see a big peak at 16 and a very, very small peak at 17. And that small peak would be 1.1% of your, of the other peak. So you'd have an M plus, um, I, I should say, your M plus one peak here is 1.1%. In other words, the statistics of having a molecule with one C13 in it is 1.1%. The statistics of having a molecule with a deuterium is essentially nil, so we almost can ignore that. Now, by comparison, then I'm going to juxt, so I'll just write this out sort of explicitly. What we're thinking is our C13 to C12 is 100 to 1.1, <clears throat> and I'll just write as by way of completeness, our hydrogen to deuterium is 100 to 0.016. So minuscule amount of the deuterium isotopolog contributing to that peak, but mostly C13, vast majority C13. If we go to ethane, now, what we're going to see in our mass spectrum is we'll see a peak at 30 and we'll see a slightly bigger peak at 31. And that peak is going to now not be 1.1%, but it's going to be roughly 2.2%. And if we want to think about the math in very simple terms, we could say the probability of one C13 is now, and it's approximately, because I'm not using good statistics, it's approximately two times 1.1%. Now there is a teeny, tiny probability of having two C13. So the probability of two C13s is going to be 1.1% of 1.1% in other words, it's going to be 0.012%. So if we had very good sensitivity and no noise or interference, you could look over here and see a, see a peak with two C13. Now, by the time you get up to really, really big molecules, like with 90 carbons or 92-ish carbons, by that point, the probability of having 1C13 is actually as great as the probability of having all C12s. So by the time you get to really big molecules with you know, 100 plus carbons, you will see the M plus one peak is bigger than the M peak. You'll see a pronounced M plus two peak 
a significant M plus three peak, and we will start to see this in examples of the homework. But for smallish molecules, you'll probably see an M plus one peak. Obviously, ethane's about as small as we would go, and you might start to see a little M plus two peak for molecules containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Now, as you get to other elements, you're going to start to have significant quantities of isotopes that are higher and particularly uh, too higher. And so I want to go ahead and talk about some signatures of isotopes. So let's talk about other elements with isotopes, common ele or elements uh, in organic chemistry. And I already mentioned that nitrogen has a little bit of nitrogen 15, not generally enough to be noticeable, 100 to 0 0.38. I mentioned that oxygen, we have O16, O17, and O18, and again, not enough to typically be noticeable, 100 to 0.04 to 0 0.020. But by the time we have other elements like silicon and sulfur, it starts to become noticeable. So silicon, for example, the predominant isotope is silicon 28, but you have a little silicon 29 and a little bit of silicon 30. And it's usually enough to see, to at least be whispering in your ear that something might be up. So the ratios of silicon 28 to 29 to 30 are 100 to 5.10 to uh, 3.35. In other words, we're going to see a significant contribution of silicon to the M plus 1 peak and a significant visible contribution to the M plus 2 peak. Ditto for sulfur, another common element in organic compounds. Sulfur is predominantly the C32 isotope, the S32 isotope, but we have a little bit of S33 and S34 to the point where the S34 is noticeable, 100 to 0 0.78 to 4.40. What I always like to say for sulfur and for silicon is if you look at a mass spectrum, they will whisper in your ear that they are present. Not all elements whisper. Some elements shout. Chlorine and bromine shout. So chlorine is predominantly chlorine 35, but there's plenty of chlorine 37. It's about a three to one ratio, 100 to 32.5. And bromine has, has almost equal amounts of bromine 79 and bromine 81. It's 100 to 98. Does the same concept apply when uh, you, know, you have to multiply? So if there's two bromines, then it would be 100. You'd see the bromine 81 peak at twice the height as the bromine 79 peak? Absolutely. If there are two bromines, we will have a statistical ratio of roughly 1 to 2 to 1. In other words, we'll see a molecular ion. We'll see an M plus 2 peak that's twice as high. And then we'll see the M plus four peak that's roughly equal in height. So it will stand out prominently. Absolutely. 
Like, What's the M plus four? Four. Two bromine. Two bromine AD ones. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So statistically, if I have let's say dibromoethane, a quarter of the molecules are going to be both have bromines or bromine seventy nine. A half the molecules are going to be one bromine 79 and one bromine 81. And a quarter of the molecules are going to be two bromine 81s. It basically coin toss statistics. If I cost toss a coin twice, on average, a quarter of the time they're both going to be heads, or half of the time one head, one tail, and a quarter of the time one, both tails. Now, not all elements have multiple isotopes. So, fluorine 19, not all elements in organic chemistry have multiple isotopes. There are, of course, plenty of elements in the periodic table, but chlor fluorine, phosphorus, and iodine are all common in organic chemicals, and all of these have just single isotopes. That's not to say other isotopes don't exist, but those isotopes are radioactive and don't exist in nature. They have to be, have to be generated and break down quickly. And I might add, all of them are used as radio tracers in various purposes. Fluorine 18 is used in PET scans. Phosphorus 32, uh, 33 and 34, I think, or um, I honestly don't remember which, maybe both are used as biotracers. And iodine 127 is used both as a biotracer and in radiomedicine. All right, so as I said, Sulfur and silicon give small but noticeable N plus two. N plus two peaks. And so let's take a look at a sketch of a mass spectrum here. We'll sketch a line for 64. Its relative intensity is 100. I'll sketch a little line for 65. Its relative intensity is 0 0.9. And I'll sketch a taller line for at 66 with a relative intensity of 5.0. And so this is a sketch of an EI mass spec. And what is the molecule of which it is a sketch? Sulfur dioxide, maybe? Yeah. Sulfur dioxide. What do people think? Give me a thumbs up or raise, raise your hand. Let's be less technological. Raise, raise your hand if you think it's SO2. Other thoughts? Could it also just be S2? Could it be? Okay, so we have SO2. 
And we have S2. S2 is a real molecule. It basically involves breakdown of the S8 ring. Uh, what do people think? That's a, that's a cool choice. Could it be S2? Could it be S8? I'm just going to take a guess. Well, S8 wouldn't have the right M to Z, right? Okay. All right. So we can't be S8, so we can rule that out. S2, of course, has 60, right? Oxygen, 16. Sulfur is 32. So how would we distinguish? Is, could it be S2? Really difficult to tell, right? Because if there was oxygen, the ratios of the isotopes are so low. Unless it's very high resolution, you can't. So we, right. So it's, we can't tell based on the mass, except if we have high accuracy mass spec. Uh, and we don't. But there is something cluing us in. Would we have an M plus four peak uh, in S2? Very, very small because only five, right, only 4.4% of sulfur is S34, so it would be 4% of 4%. So we, okay. I wouldn't see it in my drawing. All right. But what would, how big would, if we had S2, how big would the M plus 2 be? It'd be like 8%, right? It would be 8%, right. Right, if we had S2, we would expect about 8.8% M plus 2 peak. That's not, I'm doing quick and dirty statistics that are fine. If you actually want to do the real statistics, you would do the count probability that they're both, neither of them are S, S, that are S34, but it's fine for simple statistics to say it's two right? It's about two times 4.4. So this peak would be bigger. So I've drawn this as 5.0 because we've got statistically 0.2, 0.2% for O18. But basically, this is too small. The M plus 2 is too small to be S2. So this is an example here of reading spectra and using multiple inputs into your brain concepts that we've started to build on simple statistics and isotope ratios in order to suss out what molecule is present. Let's try, let's try another molecule. So bromine and chlorine both give prominent M plus two peaks. And so it's sort of hard to miss them. And so let me again sketch out a molecule. And again, it's going to be my little attempt at drawing an EI mass spectrum. So we're talking a molecule with a peak at 94, a teeny little peak at 95, a large peak at 96, and a little peak at 97. And we'll say that our large peak at 96 is a relative intensity of 98, and our small peak at 95, and our small peak at 97 is a relative intensity of 1.1. So what do we have here? There's a bromine there with one carbon. Bromine and one carbon. Yeah. And so CH2Br, right? Would that, you know, yeah, CH3Br. Uh, CH3Br. Yeah. Methyl bromide. What do, what do people think? Yay. Yeah. 
So what's giving rise to the peak at 95? The ice of the C13. So this would be, and this would be C13, H3, and I guess technically it's H13, BR79. And what's giving rise to the peak? Let's do the peak at 96. The uh, C12 H1 81 BR. Oops. And then this would be our C13 H. 1-3-B-R-81. All right, so this gets us into the mindset of looking at isotopes. And as we, as we discussed a moment ago, if you've got multiple chlorines or bromines, you're going to see prominent M plus four and M plus six peaks. Now, if you have a molecule with 168 carbons, you may also see an M plus four peak, but it's gonna be part of an isotope pattern that is very different. But if, for example, we have two chlorines in a small molecule, we'll see our M, our M plus two, and our M plus four in a nine, to six to one ratio, so very distinctive pattern. If we have two bromines, we'll see a one, as we mentioned before, a one to two to one ratio. I'll try to draw these to scale. If we have three bromines, you have to be careful because you might actually even miss the end peak. You might miss the peak of the main, I'm gonna go a little lower here. You might miss the peak of the BR79 isotopologue, the all BR79 isotopologue because you're gonna see your peaks in a one to three, to three, to one ratio. Oops, that's M plus six. And so you can see, see some very prominent peaks. And remember, these peaks are not separated by one, they're separated by two. And I think Silverstein gives a few other examples in the textbook with mixtures of chlorine and bromine, but I'll let you read on that. But I wanted to sort of give you a heads up of stuff to look for. And chlorinated compounds and brominated compounds are used industrially. I think in one of the homework examples, I have you calculate the isotope patterns for DDT that's going to have five chlorines in it, a common, common industrial, uh, you know, formally used pesticide. Um, even some computer hardware may have uh, flame retardants that have many, many bromines, like 10 bromines in it. So I think this is the last thing I wanted to say about uh, isotopes and just sort of get us set up for the homework. And I want to mention one other thing, and that is the nitrogen rule.
And this just works out based on the valences of nitrogen. And that is in EI mass spec, compounds with an odd number of nitrogens give an odd M plus. So in other words, like one nitrogen, And as an example, I'll just show us sort of by example. So if we take, let's say, trimethylamine, and this will always work out this way. If we take trimethylamine, its molecular weight, its M, is equal to 59. But if by comparison, we take triphenyl, uh, tri if we take isobutane, so I'm just sort of making an analogous structure with carbon, now we're at an even number, 58. And if we have, let's say, um, terbutanol as an example, then we're at 74. So the point is these are even, and this is odd. Now, just to give a reality check, since in EI mass spec, you get a lot of fragmentation, in EI mass spec for terbutanol, you probably wouldn't even see the molecular ion. You would probably see a fragment. You would probably see as the most prominent, as the highest peak, you would probably only see a terbutyl cation. And that terbutyl cation, so that's, that's basically M minus 17. And that's going to be 57. So that's odd. So I guess you could say this is sort of a cautionary note if you're looking at fragments. For fragments, this doesn't apply. So I'll say for fragments. Maybe the final thing I will say is that for that everything flips for ESI mass spec, and Moldy, where you have M plus H plus, for M plus Na plus. So in ESI mass spec and in Maldi, you're looking one up. So now an odd number of nitrogens gives even M plus H plus or M plus Na plus, and an even number of nitrogens goes to an odd M plus H plus, or M plus Na plus. And of course, you can see the math over here. If we put a proton onto trimethylamine, so if we ran trimethylamine in ESI mass spec, 
we would see as our peak m plus h plus, and instead of being 59, it would be 60. If we ran tert-butanol in ESI mass spec, it wouldn't fragment, and we'd see m plus h plus, right? So that has an even number, i.e. zero. It would protonate, and it would be 75 for the m plus h plus for protonated tert-butanol. So that's a little, little clue. But again, the nitrogen rule can help clue us in, sort of little things that whisper in your ear in mass spectra that you have a particular element present. I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say about isotopic abundances, exact masses, and the nitrogen rule for today, uh, as well as for high res or high accuracy mass spectra. Do we have any questions or final thoughts? I guess I could say something. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm like reading the book and uh, honestly, I don't see how, uh, maybe I'll just get this with problem solving, but with the IR, it seems pretty straightforward looking for uh, different regions that you see different functional groups. You can kind of uh, pick out some patterns, but like with the fragmentation of these different compounds, I mean, is this going to be of much use? Because it just seems like there's so many possibilities for every compound. I'm having a hard time getting patterns. I completely agree. And, you know, one of the criticisms, so the, the sort of thought is mass spec, particularly with an emphasis on fragmentation, is confusing. And given the fact that EI mass spec and MALDI have really come to predominate, a lot of what you're learning in the book is going to fall into what I would call as more specialized knowledge. And as you move through the homework, we're going to take the problems where I just asked you to read the IR mass spectra, the IR spectra last time. And I'm going to bring in the mass spectra and say, read that. And all I'm going to ask you to do is comment on the elements present. I know many people with those problems are chomping at the bit to solve the molecules. And I'll tell you two things. One, if you want to guess the structure at this point, more power to you. Two, in homework set three, I will then give you the NMR spectra. I'm encouraging you in those problems to take a slow and methodical read of each spectrum. And I'm not asking you to read much out of the mass spectra. The other thing I'll add is that Silverstein really hasn't modernized the problem. So the homework problems that I've assigned, that I've created or chosen are mostly from midterm exams. And they're going to bring in more modern concepts. There's not gonna be a lot of fragmentation in there. I'm going to have two frag one at least one problem with fragmentation. So you'll get a McClafferty rearrangement and maybe another cleavage off a carbonyl group, which you're going to read about in one molecule, just to see how you can identify where a chlorine and a bromine is in the molecule. Everything else is going to focus on concepts of isotope patterns, on concepts of determining um, M to Z, to understanding the concept of M to Z and multiply charged compounds, on really understanding and thinking, drilling down on molecular formulas, understanding inaccuracies. And so that's gonna be the big push as we move into this. Now, the good news is mass spec is the worst chapter, or should I say the most irrelevant chapter 
in Silverstein. As we move into NMR, the treatment's going to be very, very good, as I think it was in IR. And in fact, in IR, you know, we had like the pentane dione problem that was directly, you know, basically just read and regurgitate one paragraph and you've answered the question. So as we move into the NMR part, I think Silverstein will improve. Is that helpful? Yeah, definitely. That's relieving too, because I don't think, uh, I don't know, this fragmentation stuff, having a hard time getting much out of it. So that's good to hear. Yeah, and for a while I had one, one homework or exam problem that had six simple compounds and I took people through the fragmentation. It was very beautiful, but I think reasonably arcane. I took people through an alcohol, an ether, an amine, a ketone, an ester, and an amide. And we looked at all the fragmentation. And I just decided, yeah, if you're using GC mass spec on a synthetic methods project that might be useful to you, but you're probably going to bring other tools to bear. And so I finally just decided we were just spending too much mental energy on something that was, was too, too specialized. Ditto on proteomics. I mean, I would say, again, if you're going to be doing proteomics, you're going to want to go more in depth to uh, fragmentation and MS, MS. So good question. Other, other questions or other thoughts? All right, so let's, um, let's reconvene on Friday and we'll pick up, we'll finish up mass spec. I will take us through a little bit of fragmentation just so you can see it. And I think we'll do McClafferty rearrangement. I may, I'll see how far I go in the handouts on that. I know I have a lot of, a lot of material in my notes that I've written down is optional but I wouldn't expect you to go much further than we go in the home.